You're listening to The Coffee Hour. I'm Andy Bates. I'm Sarah Golseth. We're going to learn more about church workers, particularly pastors and, and other church workers and how they serve the church. And what's that, that process of formation like as well in just a moment? Thanks to Concordia University, Wisconsin for supporting the Coffee Hour. Find out more about Concordia University, Wisconsin at cuw.edu. Live Uncommon. Joining us today, the Reverend Dr. James Bonnick, Executive Director of the LCMS Office of Pastoral Education, wrote a great article in the Lutheran Witness August issue as well, Understanding the Church Worker Recruitment Initiative. Dr. Bonnick, thanks for being our guest on the Coffee Hour. Yeah, great to be here. Thanks. So... You wrote in this article uh, a great explanation of who pastors are, what is the, the office of pastor, why does the church need pastors? You give us a little bit of, bit of that history, but share that with us today. Why does the church need pastors? Well, first of all, God commanded this office. It's the one commanded office in the scriptures. And he commanded them to preach the gospel administer the sacraments and in order to do that knowing his sheep repentance impenitence their life knowing them very well and how to apply those sacraments and with all that goes pastoral care with that preached word and the administration of the sacraments god calls his pastors to shepherd his sheep to Mm -hmm. shepherd his people and not just in this life but although that's important especially for guiding and leading them toward their eternal life through Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. So how do pastors carry out the ministry, uh, Christ's ministry today in the church today? Well, the number one thing they do is preach the word. We even have an initiative (laughs) about preach the word. (laughs) How appropriate. (laughs) Yeah, how appropriate. And anyway, so they they do preach the word and they take the word of God and they apply it to the lives of God's people in its law and in its gospel. Most of all, announcing the forgiveness of sins to their people. People are very burdened. Their consciences are burdened. And again, teach, well, not again, but teaching the word in Bible class and giving pastoral care to them in their, when they're in the hospital, when they're going through troubled times in life. And then certainly the administration of the sacraments, feeding them God's body and blood and baptizing them. We live in a very pluralistic society <laughs> and Christians from all many different confessions and traditions. And so the the idea of the office of pastor, when depending on what tradition and confession people are coming from, can look very different. So here's our opportunity <laughs> to, to really clarify what is and what isn't the pastoral ministry. Well, the pastor is called and ordained. He's called by God through a local congregation. That's scriptural, and our confessions reflect that, and our confessions are not an extra made-up set of documents, but they certainly reflect what the Word of God says. So the pastor is one of uh, the laity who are raised up as the pastor who will teach and preach that word. And in our, well, Jesus himself formed the disciples, formed the apostles. And so we do the same thing through our pre-seminary and especially our seminary formation at our seminaries. How, why is there sometimes confusion about what the role of pastor is? Disagreements between, even within our own Lutheran church, disagreements about, never. Uh, no, right? We, don't ever I, we have never those. argue. <laughs> disagreements about, about what that role actually is and what it means in a, in a day to day living out our vocations. Yeah, I'm old enough to remember the book Everyone a Minister. I don't want to say anything wrong, but we're not all ordained ministers. God raises some up from among his people to do that. However, the Lord has given us many vocations. A mother or a father certainly do teach the Word of God to their children. One lay person certainly does console another lay person with the Word of God. But publicly and representing Christ among his people, God raises up these pastors. And also, They are specifically taught 
the Word of God, how to interpret it, what it means, and then how to apply this to God's people. For instance, I'm not an electrician. I don't know (laughs) what all the terminology means, so I could not teach you how to be an electrician or anything. You wouldn't want me to do anything electric. But And the same thing is with a pastor. He's taught specifically what this word is to teach it to God's people, not just to fill them with knowledge, of course, but the Holy Spirit then creates faith through that preached word. So that's pretty important. I mean, this we're talking about eternal life um, here. Mm-hmm. So I guess another illustration would be you, you know, have have to have open heart surgery. You want your heart surgeon to have the proper education formation, really. Mm-hmm to do that surgery, right? Exactly. So you want that when we're talking about something even more important, this matters of souls. Right. We mm-hmm. want the person who is caring for those souls in a in in this public capacity to be properly formed. Well, that, that's exactly right. Yeah. And especially when we're talking about the eternal salvation and eternal life of souls, we want a physician of the word um, of the soul, um, applying that word to to the soul, to and the, where the Lord gives healing and cure for sins, and even comforts and consoles us for this life. Mm-hmm. There's a German word for that, isn't it? Seelsorger. Seelsorger, yeah. I was going to ask about that. That's pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> I love that I word. I didn't attempt to pronounce it. I just knew <laughs> I've, I've read it multiple times. <laughs> I'm a fan of German. <laughs> So we we talked about pastors, and we're looking at the the church worker recruitment initiative. In addition to pastors, are there others who serve in the church, and what do we call them? <laughs> right. Well, in in Missouri Synod circles, we call the pastors ministers of religion ordained, and for all the other serving offices in the church, we call them ministers of religion commissioned. And so those individuals, those are very important positions. We developed them. We formed those offices. They are not biblical mandated office, but they're like uh, director of Christian education, DCE, director of Christian outreach, DCO, or deaconess, a female servant in the church, the Lutheran school teacher, the church musician, one that is commissioned to do that special work. There are there are some other ones, family life ministry. Mm-hmm. And, and we... In our agenda, which is the book that we use to like install <laughs> uh, these workers into the church, we call them helping offices or auxiliary offices. They're extremely important offices, and we we develop these offices to be the helping office of of the pastor, where they certainly do for like a instance, the Lutheran school teacher teaches the Word of God to little children. DC, I mean, I'm sorry, well, DC too would teach oftentimes to youth. They're oftentimes youth directors or deaconess, especially going into a human care situation, maybe an elderly woman in the nursing home or at home, and may read scripture, sing a hymn to them. But that's all under that's all under the office of the pastor. They're helping offices of the pastoral office. Mm-hmm. How do those positions all work hand in hand what is the benefit of having those those extra auxiliary offices in the church in order to work how does that how does that help the pastor also carry out his his duties yeah you know we did a building project once in north dakota when i was pastor there and it amazed me that as more than ever even the lay people the gifts and talents that they had from engineers to architects to businessmen. And I thought, there's no way I could do any of this. I mean, this is my expertise was not in that at all. Mm-hmm. And I was so thankful for those positions. Well, translate that to the life of the church. You've got the Lutheran school teacher who who has the patience and the care and the the ability to be able to teach children. I mean, that's extremely important, shaping and raising and forming them in the Christian faith, besides all the other subjects. Um, or a deaconess who, 
who makes a number of visits and calls on individuals who are sick, who may have some emotional situations, or so it's it's where it's it's specialized gifts in the church or a youth worker. The pastor should be have some ability in those. I mean, he should be able to relate to children. He should be able to make a hospital visit on somebody who is ill. But these are helping offices because we're all then caring for uh, our neighbor and uh, under the pastor caring for the souls of God's people. So that working together, the the auxiliary offices working together with the pastor is, is very important in order for the one, for the ministry to be joyful, but but two, to be done faithfully, they need to be working together and collaborating. Exactly, mm-hmm. right. I want to learn more about the church worker recruitment initiative, what that is. It sounds like we're recruiting church workers, so we'll <laughs> learn more about that in just a little bit. We're talking with Reverend Dr. James Bonick, Executive Director of the LCMS Office of Pastoral Education. You're listening to The Coffee Hour. I'm Andy Bates. I'm Sarah Golseth. You're a miracle. You know that, right? A living, breathing, one-of-a-kind miracle. You were created to stand apart, to share your gifts in the service of others, to make an uncommon impact in a common world. And at Concordia University, it's our mission to help you do that, to live uncommon. To learn more about Concordia, go to cuw.edu. Welcome back to the Coffee Hour. I'm Andy Bates. I'm Sarah Golseth. Today we're talking with Reverend Dr. James Bonick, Executive Director of the LCMS Office of Pastoral Education, learning more about the Church Worker Recruitment Initiative. What is the Church Worker Recruitment Initiative, Dr. Bonick? Well, this is only a half hour show, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I could talk hours on this one. Uh, well, it started way back in 2018. I won't go through all the minute history, but I think it's important to recognize that a number of leaders did come together in uh, 2018, like President Harrison, the seminary presidents, Concordia University uh, presidents. Really what we were talking about was pastoral formation. Where are we today? Where are we going to be in 15 years from now? What's the relationship of past? I mean, of the seminaries and uh, the International Center and the work that we do here, Synod headquarters? And by the time we ended that meeting two days later, we walked out of there 100% unanimous that we want to do a unified church worker recruitment initiative, not just pastor, but recruiting all church workers, because we recognized we have some statistics about enrollment that is down tremendously at our Concordia system. For instance, pre-seminary enrollment at our Concordia is down 59% in the last 14 years. Mm-hmm. Lutheran school teacher down 61%. And we could go through all those offices and talk about you know, how they're down But we also recognize that we don't want to have an initiative that's driven by fear because we know the Lord can take care of his church, but it's what the Lord calls us to do. And maybe the statistics were a little wake-up call to remind us what we're supposed to do, (laughs) and uh, that is to form and shape pastors and, and workers for the church. So we went to the convention in 2019, the Synod Convention, and there's a resolution, 601. <laughs> if you have a, a pet uh, resolution, you know its number all the time, but 601. <laughs> and it was a Synod-wide church worker recruitment initiative. And uh, we then moved into research phase, because it passed, by the way, by 94%, which is marvelous. Mm -hmm. Actually, I'm just going to back up a little bit. So the initiative itself is identifying, catechizing, encouraging, and supporting young boys and girls for church work vocations, instilling church worker vocations as sacred and joyful, a calling from God, vocations of integrity and fulfillment, grounded in church work uh, in Christ and baptismal salvation, 
Third, developing the whole person. And uh, when we talk about the whole person, we're talking about spiritual development, development in character, confessional development, physical development, emotional development, development in understanding who we are as synod working together, and intellectual development. And the fourth component was supporting and caring for our existing church workers. One, because that's what we should do, but secondly, we need healthy workers in order to promote our children and encourage our children to be church workers. So, like I said, it passed by 94%. We went into then a research phase where we did um, research. We had two big surveys. Over 2,500 people uh, responded to these surveys. And then we also had, I think, 10 focus groups, including pastors, multicultural pastors, along serving pastors, campus pastors, youth workers in DCEs, rostered teachers and non-rostered teachers, Lutheran High School, guidance counselors, youth under age 18, lay persons from congregations who send many to church work, parents of church workers and district presidents. And we, that was like six months worth of intense research. So after the convention, we weren't saying much about it because we were doing a lot of groundwork for this initiative. We have some summary research findings. Do we have time just to share a few of those? Sure, yep. So <clears throat> what we found out from our, oh, by the way, we used Aslanian Company who does re- education resor- research. So it was an outside research firm that worked with us. But we found out that the age of the greatest potential influence for one to consider church work is middle school. Mm. That really kind of surprised us. We thought maybe high school. You know, we do a lot of work with our senior high youth, which we should do. But we found out that uh, high schoolers are already beginning to form in their minds what they want to do. Junior high was great. Most church workers come from parents who are church workers. That probably isn't a surprise. By the way, we kind of had an idea of some of these things anecdotally, but we wanted the research to back it up. Primary influencers are, number one, pastors, and two, parents, and after that, youth workers, grandparents, school teachers, coaches, music directors, congregational members, and then especially in the high school years, their peers. We also found out only 50%, according to our survey, only 50, 50% of church workers are currently having the conversation with youth concerning church work. So that's mm-hmm. certainly something we want to work on. We are not, so therefore, we're not being intentional about identifying and encouraging and forming our children to be church workers. Church workers are encouraged to talk about and display the joys and purpose of church work. We found out that when our children are hearing church workers talk about church work, it's oftentimes negative. And we all do that in our own work, you know, where we're maybe suffering or things aren't going well. But especially when our children are in earshot, we (laughs) really need to help them understand there are joys, certainly, and there's a great purpose in being a church worker. Primary influencers would be helped with resources. They told us, we want resources. Help us to be able to talk to uh, a child, uh, a middle schooler, uh, a high schooler about this. The cost of uh, Lutheran education is definitely a factor, especially for our parents. They're very concerned about how much it would cost for them and their children. We also found out that 91% of church workers now attended Uh, weekly worship services as a child. So it's very important to be grounded in the Word, in uh, the divine service, receive pastoral care from their pastor, which we talked about earlier. So those are some of our findings. That then led us to work with another company, communications and marketing company called Standing Partnership here in St. Louis. And by the way, we're all working in tandem, Aslani in the research, all of us here at the International Center, and then Standing Partnership. All the way through the process, we were already working all together, and we knew Aslani would then hand off their work to like Standing Partnership. And so through Standing Partnership and my office, the Pastoral of Education, and the chief mission officer here in the building, and certainly the synod president was involved in this as well. 
we came up with two major goals for the initiative. One was to increase fruitful engagement between youth and influencers on individual journeys toward professional church work vocations, and secondly, significantly increase the number of individuals enrolled in church worker formation and education tracks, especially at our Lutheran schools, our Concordia University system, and then certainly going into one of our two seminaries. We realized that in order to do this, we had to build visibility, so thus initiative to, to let the whole synod know that we're doing this together. We need to change perceptions, or at least we need or, or correct some things. For instance, if education is outrageously expensive, what are we going to do about that? So influence behaviors, we know we need to do that. For instance, we need to encourage our church workers to talk to our children about church work. And then we also need to intentionally engage, which kind of goes with the one I just said. We developed five major strategies, and one was to establish church worker formation as a long-term synod-wide initiative. By the way, Church Worker Recruitment Initiative may not be its name. (laughs) We purposely did not name this thing because we didn't want it just to be a gimmicky, fly-by-night, another thing Synod sort of does. So actually, I go to a meeting right after this where we're going to really be talking about what are we going to name this thing. Number two is establish a three-stage emerging church worker leader program. And this is kind of the guts of the whole thing because... Our research company and our marketing company came back at us and said, do you know the one gem you have in your church? And we said, well, we know we have lots of gems. (laughs) They said, it's your seventh and eighth grade emphasis in the catechism. Hmm. And uh, they said our church worker, current church workers just talked about that being an especially formational period in their life. It's also the one time where the Usually the pastor, not always, but usually the pastor has one-on-one attention with, with these youth. And so we broke our age groups down. We're specializing in infant baptism through sixth grade, seventh and eighth grade, and then ninth through twelfth grade. The third goal or strategy is to equip critical influencers to identify and encourage young leaders. So by doing that, we're getting subject matter experts. We have In each of those age groups, we have about six or seven subject matter experts across the synod from lay people to pastors to administrators, just the whole gamut, um, covering a whole spectrum of synod, synod, and they have already agreed. Now we're, we're now in the process of scheduling them to tell them more about what their work will be doing and it will be to provide resources, whether it's written resources or video, Vimeo, YouTube resources. And I just had a meeting this morning with our communications department about planting this on our website in a number of ways and platforms and apps. So we want to saturate (laughs) the synod (laughs) with this initiative. We want to develop a continuous insight loop to develop in our development, which means we're going to continue to do research. The things we found out we don't know the answers to, we're going to continue to research. And we already have a survey going, st- starting to uh, be written moving forward. And then position church workers as admirable champions of humility and service. An easy way of saying that is we want our children to look at a pastor or a DCE or a Lutheran school teacher and say, I want to be one of those. So that's what we're after. Well, we'll be watching for more information then, I guess, at lcms.org. Yes. Is that the best place? Mm -hmm. Great article in the Lutheran Witness, August 2021 issue as well. Our guest today, the Reverend Dr. James Bonnick, Executive Director of the LCMS Office of Pastoral Education. Thanks so much for being our guest. Thank you very much. You've been listening to The Coffee Hour. I'm Andy Bates. I'm Sarah Golseth. The Coffee Hour with Andy and Sarah is a production of KFUO. To support The Coffee Hour and KFUO Radio, visit KFUO.org. You can also text KFUO to 41444 or send an email to gifts at KFUO.org. And you can call us at 800-844-0524. KFUO. Christ for you. Anytime. Anywhere. Anywhere.